Good morning, I'm Mike Grable. Today we're going to be talking about Article 3, which creates the judiciary. I'm trying to break these into small chunks so that you don't have to get too much information at once, so you don't have to cover topics that you're not particularly uh, having difficulty with. Article 3 is uh, very short. It essentially has three sections. Article 1, which says uh, all of the judicial power of the United States is vested in the Supreme Court and such inferior tr tribunals as Congress may from time to time create or ordain, something of that nature, which essentially says all the judicial power is going to be uh, resident only in this third branch of government that we're creating. Uh, it provides that people will be able to hold their term of office and, and that you can't reduce their salary while they're in office. Uh, section 2 deals with the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. That is going to become particularly important when we discuss judicial review because the concept of the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court as it stood essentially at the end of Marbury versus Madison is that unless a case involves ambassadors, uh, that is those coming from other countries uh, to meet in a diplomatic capacity with diplomatic figures in the United States, particularly the President, who as we discuss in Article 2, has the power to negotiate treaties, uh, with the exception of ambassadors and in suits between the states, the Supreme Court doesn't have any original jurisdiction. The rest of it is all going to be appellate jurisdiction. So of necessity that is going to require us to talk a little bit about the court structure of the United States. The way the courts are structured in the United States, and we'll do it top down, uh, even though in reality, if a case is filed, it's going to go bottom up. Okay, but think of it like uh, a wedding cake, if you will. At the top, you have the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the number is nine judges set by statute. Uh, it can be changed. Uh, it, in the past, it has been, I believe, as few as three. Uh, I know that when Franklin Roosevelt was president, he had a, a theory. Uh, that since Congress kept declaring, I'm sorry, since the Supreme Court kept declaring Congress's ideas uh, unconstitutional, uh, the, the programs that, I, that, that, that Franklin Roosevelt wanted passed, uh, they were somewhat draconian, they, I believe, were clearly unconstitutional, uh, and when that few of them got struck down, he said, well, why don't I just get Congress to set by statute a larger number of justices for the Supreme Court, since I've got six on there that are a problem and three on there that aren't, if I can appoint five, then by eight to six, we'll win everything. Uh, just the threat of that was enough to get the Supreme Court to back down, some argue. Some people say that's not true. The Supreme Court just had this sudden shift in mentality and decided that everything in the New Deal uh, was going to be fine and no longer was impeded by constitutional restraint. I don't think that is accurate. But at any rate, at the top level, the highest level, you have the United States Supreme Court. Beneath them are the 12 courts of appeals. There are 11 based on geographic regions. Here in Texas, we're located in the fifth, uh, the fifth circuit court of appeals. So, for instance, if you had an appeal uh, from a Texas district court, it would go to the fifth circuit court of appeals. And then those are your lower level courts, your district courts. So at the bottom of our imaginary cake here, if you will, you have your district courts. These are called courts of original jurisdiction because, as I said, with the exception of suits between states, uh, which primarily involve water rights or boundary disputes, and suits involving ambassadors, the Supreme Court doesn't have original jurisdiction. You can't file a case in the Supreme Court unless it involves the things that the Constitution says they have original jurisdiction over. So if you have a case that is filed under federal law, or if you have a case involving what's called diversity of citizenship, that is one person lives in one state, the other lives in a different state, uh, at the time uh, of the Constitution, they were a little bit concerned that people might get hometowned, and so they would say if you had diversity of citizenship that you were allowed to bring that in federal courts. By bringing it in the federal court system, you would initiate the original jurisdiction of the district court. That is the lowest level on the totem pole. Assuming for sake of argument, there's something that's gone wrong, and you have some question of review, uh, generally questions of law, not of fact, because they don't hear evidence, you appeal the case from the district court. You appeal it to the intermediate court of appeals. 
the Court of Appeals then reviews the law and ensures that the facts which were taken at the district court, the court with original jurisdiction, applied the law correctly to the facts. If it did so, uh, then it affirms the case. If it finds some mistake of law has been committed, then it reverses the case. Sometimes it, it remands the case, which means take another look at it because you didn't apply the law correctly. Sometimes they look at it and say, we see what the facts are, and this is the way the law should have applied, and they render a judgment on it. That is an appeal of right. Once you lose in the district court, you have a right to appeal your case to the Court of Appeals. The problem comes if you want the Supreme Court to hear your case. People well, say, I'm going to take this to the Supreme Court. Well, it's not as easy as it sounds. You have to file what's called a writ of certiorari from each of the Courts of Appeals, uh, or from the, all of the Courts of Appeals. There are about 8,000 of these things filed every year. And the Supreme Court only grants about 200 of them. So it's a very select group of cases. And they choose these cases based on the level of importance that they grant that particular legal issue. Sometimes what happens is you get uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals out in California uh, does sort of something crazy, and then you've got another Court of Appeals, um, maybe the Fifth Circuit, which is a more conservative Court of Appeals, or the Eleventh Circuit out of Florida, uh, or out of Atlanta, which, which encompasses Florida, and you get a conflict so that the district courts don't know who they should uh, abide by unless they're in either the Ninth Circuit, in which case they have to do what that appellate court tells them the law is, or in the Fifth, they have to do what they're told to do by that. But sometimes you get these uh, conflicts arise, and they're clear, they're easy to see. One, one court of appeal says it has to go one way, the other court of appeal says it has to go a different way. And so the Supreme Court, through a process called writ of certiorari, which is a Latin word uh, and it is hard to spell, but if you see it on the exam or anywhere, you'll immediately recognize it. Uh, a writ of certiorari is filed in which you, the, the party asks the Supreme Court for permission to have their case heard. If it's granted, then you're actually allowed to argue the case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court considers the case. Uh, then they'll draft an opinion and release an opinion. The other place that the Supreme Court can hear appeals from, remember we've got our three-tiered cake, our district courts, which are courts of original jurisdiction, our courts of appeals, which are appellate jurisdiction, and then our Supreme Court, which essentially has discretionary jurisdiction because it only hears the appeals it wants, with those two exceptions, right? Ambassadors and suits between states. The other way that you can get a case to the Supreme Court is if you've gone all the way to the Supreme Court of your state. So, for instance, you file something in a district court in Texas. Uh, mostly it happens in criminal cases, quite frankly, but you file something in a district court in Texas. It's appealed to the Court of Appeals. Then it goes to the Texas Supreme Court. They issue an opinion. You have the opportunity to file a certiorari to the United States Supreme Court and beg them to hear it. Uh, with regard to invalidating statutes, it is probably more likely that you're actually going to get your case heard. So if you've got a criminal case and you want to invalidate a statute, the Supreme Court has historically uh, had a tendency to deem those as cases that they would take under consideration. So the process in, uh, in getting to the Supreme Court, you know how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Uh, the process of getting to the United States Supreme Court is you either have to go through all the levels of your state and then exhaust your appeal at the highest level of your state court and then ask for a writ of certiorari from the United States Supreme Court, which as I said, long shot, 200 out of 8,000 are granted. Or going through the district courts, which are the courts of original jurisdiction, the courts of appeals, which have appellate jurisdiction, or uh, and then petitioning for a writ of certiorari in order to get to the Supreme Court. We didn't have time to get to judicial review. We will cover that one next time. That is a very important topic. But that essentially is an overview of how the federal court system works.